Morning. So yesterday, yesterday what we learned was that a good shepherd provides for all the needs of his sheep. A good shepherd provides sustenance, food. A good shepherd provides quiet waters and refreshing. A good shepherd provides guidance. A good shepherd provides for all of the needs of his sheep. And in the same way, in the same way, God, as our good shepherd, provides for all of our needs in Jesus Christ. That in Jesus Christ, we have peace. In Jesus, we have completeness. In Jesus, we have guidance throughout the twists and the turns of our lives to know which way is the right path. In Jesus, we have all of our needs met. But one of the other things that we learned yesterday was in order to receive this guidance from Jesus, in order to receive what the shepherd has to offer, we have to be willing to listen to the shepherd's voice. We have to adopt a posture of surrender to our shepherd, to trust him, to not to tune out the voices of our world, to tune out the voices of our culture who are all telling us you can have your needs met in all of these other things, right? To learn to tune those voices out and instead to listen to our good shepherd and in him receive, finally receive peace. That's, the, that's what we learned yesterday. In the next line of this psalm, though, we learn that the shepherd provides something else for us. Because not only did every sheep rely on the shepherd for provision, every sheep also relies on the shepherd for protection. Because sheep were always exposed. Sheep are always vulnerable to danger. And sheep, unfortunately, are also a little dumb. Sheep are constantly wandering off. Sheep are constantly getting themselves into trouble. And so, for this reason, shepherds had to be extremely diligent about watching over, taking care of their sheep, and protecting them from danger. To help with this task, shepherds had two tools. So they had um, this, this rod here, sort of like a baseball bat. This would have been hanging from a belt. And they would have used this to fight off predators. Predators who, I mean, this is, this is nice. You could do some damage with this. Um, this would be used to fight off predators who would want to attack, destroy, kill the sheep. Shepherd would also have a staff that would look something like this. And the staff would sometimes be used to, to get the sheep back into, uh, into order, to, to lead them on the right path. Sometimes the staff would also be used to fight off predators as well. But the shepherd would have these two tools in order to protect his sheep who are always finding their way into trouble, who are always at danger, in danger of either, either wandering off or being attacked by predators. And so you need, to, you need to kind of get out of your mind this picture of a shepherd, of being like this gentle, mild-mannered person, you know, the, the person that we maybe have in our imagination. Um, shepherds were warriors. You think about David in the Old Testament, the book of 1 Samuel. David, who, by the way, wrote Psalm 23. One of the things we learn about David in 1 Samuel is that David, when he was a young man, probably about your age actually, fought off lions and bears who were attempting to destroy his flock. That's a shepherd. A shepherd was a warrior who was tasked with defending his sheep. And so what we read in Psalm 23 is we read in this next line, 
even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I want to talk to you this morning about dark valleys. I want to talk to you about dark valleys. I want to talk to you about walking through dark valleys. And I want you, I want you to know just a few things. In the, in the brief time that I have this morning, I want you to know a few things about dark valleys. Okay? Here's the first thing that I want you to know. The first thing I want you to know about dark valleys is don't be surprised. Don't be surprised by the valley. The psalm says, even though I walk through the darkest valley. Did you catch the language there? Even though I walk through the, there's no resentment. There's no pouting. There's no surprise. There's no blaming. It's just assumed that dark valleys are, in fact, a part of life. I want you to do an exercise, mental exercise, just for a moment. I want you to think about all the characters you know from Scripture. All the, all the big names that you know from Scripture. And I want you to think through the list of names of those people who spent time wandering through a dark valley. A difficult season. A challenging time. Uh, I want you to think through li- who's on that list. You know, you think, of, you think of somebody like Moses, for instance. Moses, given the task of going into Egypt and, and helping to liberate God's people from slavery. But before he did that, Moses had to spend 40 years in exile, in isolation, in the desert. That's Moses. Or you think about David himself, the writer of this psalm. David, chosen as a young man. He's chosen by Samuel. He says, Samuel says, you're going to be the next king. But before he becomes king, David has to spend years of his life, years of his life, hiding, running away from people trying to kill him, actually living with his enemies, living in the midst of his enemies before he would finally become king. You think about somebody like the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. Paul has this amazing conversion event, right? Where he goes from, Paul goes from a person, a religious zealot, persecuting Christians, hunting Christians down, to actually becoming one of the chief missionaries and preachers in the early church. Dedicating his life fully to Jesus Christ, fully to the gospel. But in that work that he'd been given, he spends time in prison multiple times. He's beaten multiple times. Spending multiple years of his life walking through a dark valley. Just think about, the, think about Jonah. Think about Noah. Think about Elijah. Think about Daniel and the lion's den. Think about all these different characters from Scripture. And then think about Jesus himself. Jesus himself. There's this, you know, we're told a story in Matthew's gospel. Jesus is baptized. This baptism event marks the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And then immediately after Jesus' baptism, immediately, the very next passage in the gospel of Matthew, it says that Jesus was led into the wilderness for a period of 40 days, 40 days of testing. That was Jesus. You have a hard time finding any major character in Scripture who God used who didn't also spend some difficult time in a dark valley. In fact, it seems like in Scripture, 
It's the dark valley. It's the desolate places. It's the difficult seasons. It's in those times where God prepares his servants, where God prepares his kingdom workers. If you want to be used by God, here's the lesson. If you want to be used by God, you probably should prepare yourself to endure a dark valley. God never promised us, any of us, a life free of hardship. He didn't. He never promised that we would never leave those green pastures or those quiet waters. In fact, if you want to follow God in this world, you need to be prepared for some dark valleys for some trouble, for some hardship. I don't know any follower of Jesus in my life who doesn't follow Jesus with a limp, having endured a dark valley or two. So the first lesson is be prepared. Don't be surprised by the dark valleys that you encounter. And don't be overwhelmed by them. Matter of fact, I think think a good question for each of us to ask when we're going through a dark valley is this. God, what are you teaching me? What do you want me to learn? How do you want me to grow? Lord, how 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 are you going to use this dark valley in my life right now, the situation that I'm going through? God, I don't like it, I hate it, but what are you teaching me in this moment? What kind of person do you want me to be on the other side of this dark valley? If you want to follow God in this world, if you want to be used by God in your life, don't be surprised by dark valleys. Dark valleys are times of preparation. Here's the second thing. Second thing is, when you're going through a dark valley, look around. Take a moment and look around. Because here's the thing, not every dark valley is exactly the same. Not every dark valley is exactly the same. I've found in my life that it's helpful when we're going through periods of difficulty to spend some time reflecting on what might be causing that difficulty. What might have led me into this dark valley? Sometimes we enter into dark valleys because, just like a sheep, we make foolish choices. We make foolish choices. For, for years, I, I led a D group of boys. Started with the same group of boys when they were in fifth grade. Walked with them every year until they graduated high school last year. It was awesome. It was amazing. Um, But there were a lot of moments, especially in like that fifth, sixth, seventh grade, those years right there, where like our time in D group was a disaster. It was just a lot, okay? Can I get an amen? Like seventh grade boys are a lot. Seventh grade boys are a lot, okay? Um, And there were so many, like we had our D groups on Wednesday nights, and there were so many times. I, I... I promise you, I said this so many times, where I would just stop whatever we were talking about, and I'd ask my my boys this question. I'd say, boys, I I asked it so many times, they'd just start to roll their eyes. I'd be like, boys, can you tell me the difference between ignorance and foolishness? And again, they would roll their eyes because they'd heard me say this so many times. They'd say, well... Ignorance is when you do something that's wrong, but you don't know any better. Foolishness is when you do something that's wrong, but you do know better. And I'd say, that's the right answer. So can you tell me in this moment, are you being ignorant or are you being a fool? Nine times out of ten, they're just being fools. A lot of the dark valleys that we enter into in our life are because, honestly, we're making rebellious, foolish choices against what we know is good. And that leads us into a dark valley. But there are other dark valleys that we enter into that are really no fault of our own. We enter into a dark valley because of circumstances that are not our fault. And some of you are in this type of dark valley even now. 
Sometimes you enter into a dark valley because, honestly, because of the selfish and foolish choices that someone else made. Sometimes you enter into a dark valley just because life in this world is just kind of full of hardship. And sometimes, you know, people in your life, they get sick. Parents get divorced. Difficult seasons happen. It's no fault of your own, but you just wake up one day and you realize, I'm in a dark valley, I'm in a dark place. Sometimes our dark valleys are because of broken relationships or because of emotional wounds. Sometimes dark valleys are because of our stubbornness or our addictions. So here's my advice to you. When you feel like you're going through a dark valley, ask some honest questions about what led you into that dark valley. How did you end up there? And that's not guaranteed to make the dark valley go away. It won't make the dark valley go away. But at least it'll make it a little bit more easy to navigate that dark valley if you have an understanding of what led you there. Here's the third point. Third point is look to others. When you're in that dark valley, look to others. The book of Hebrews is a book in the New Testament that was addressed to Christians who were going through some difficulties following Jesus. Following Jesus for them had become difficult. Following Jesus had, had become challenging. And as a result, many of them, many of these Christians, they were thinking about dropping away from Jesus altogether. At the end of the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, here's what the writer says. He says, and let us consider, listen, let us consider how we can spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but actually encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, whether it's because of pride or shame or discouragement, the first thing that many of us do when we enter into a dark valley is we tend to isolate ourselves. We isolate ourselves from the very people who might actually be able to encourage us and help us. We need each other in the dark valley. I'm absolutely convinced of this, that it is so often the case that God will use the other people in our lives. God will use our church family, our fellow believers. God will use them to help us walk through those dark valleys. But what's critically important is when we are in that moment of difficulty, when we're in that dark valley, not to withdraw from community, but to actually lean into community. I know some of you out there right now are going through a dark valley. I know that for you, community is hard. It's hard to be around other people when you are struggling so much and your temptation is going to be to isolate. Some of you, you're, you're going to go home from this week and you're going to ghost the rest of your youth group. They're going to look around like, man, whatever happened to her? What happened to him? Like we had such a great, and now they're just, they just bailed? Like when we do that, we remove one of God's greatest gifts in our life when we're walking through a dark valley, the encouragement that we can receive from one another. And I'll also add this. One of the greatest gifts that you can give to another person is to help them as they're walking through a dark valley. You have people in your youth group right now, I know this because I've already talked to some of you this week, who are walking through a dark valley. Guys, we have an obligation to each other to encourage and help one another as we're walking through that dark valley. So when you're walking through that valley, just know you are not alone. You are not alone. Here's the last point. And this is the main point from Psalm 23. Look to Jesus. Look to your good shepherd. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I'll fear no evil. And this isn't an irrational confidence. Okay, this isn't an irrational confidence. It says, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. This isn't ir an irrational confidence. This is confidence 
based on who the shepherd is. So much of our fear, if you think about the things in your life that make you afraid, or the times in your life where you've experienced a lot of fear, so much of the fear in our lives stems from or comes from our feeling of not being in control. Feeling like things are out of control. If you, again, think about the last moment in your life that you were just really, really afraid, that you were terrified. And I guarantee if you think about that moment, one of the things that will come along with that moment is this feeling that I don't have control of this situation. And, and I don't feel like anybody is in control of this situation. Our fear comes from a lack of control. Control is the difference between peace and fear. The problem is that we can't control all of the circumstances of our life. We can't. We can't control all the circumstances of our life. But we know, we know who can. We know who can. Our good shepherd. It's not, if you read this psalm, it's not the rod and the staff that comfort us. That's, that's, not, that's not what he says. It's not the rod and the staff that bring comfort. It's the one who holds the rod and the staff that bring comfort. It's the one who holds the rod and the staff. The same God who leads us beside quiet waters will not abandon us in our dark valleys. Our good shepherd protects us and teaches us. I, um, I remember when um, I was at a kind of kind of a transition point in my life, um, trying, to, trying to figure out what the next chapter of my life was going to hold. I, I, was, I was young, I was um, relatively um, newly married, we had a, a baby, young, young child, and I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do with my life. Couldn't figure out where I wanted to go. And I was full of confusion, I was full of anxiety, I was terrified that I was going to make the wrong choice, and I was terrified because I felt just out of control. I felt like I didn't know which way to go. And I went to my dad in this season, as I often do, uh, my dad's one of the wisest men that I know, I went to my dad and I explained to him what I was feeling, I explained to him what I was going through, and my dad, very calmly, he looked at me and he asked me this question. He said, Chad, are you committed to following Jesus whatever choice you end up making? Are you committed to following Jesus? Whatever, cho whatever choice you end up making in this season, whatever you decide to do, wherever you decide to go, are you committed to following Jesus? And I looked at my dad and I said, well, yeah. Yeah, I am. And he looked at me and he smiled and he said, well then son, what you need to understand is there is no risk. There is no risk. When you are committed to Jesus, when you're committed to following Jesus wherever you go, there is no risk. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. The one who gave his life for me, the one who defeated sin, the one who defeated death, the one who creates and sustains everything that exists, he's with you. There is no risk in that dark valley. Are dark valleys fun? No. Are dark valleys scary? Sure. But I know who my shepherd is. I know his care for me. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. His rod and the staff, they comfort me. In your darkest valley, in your darkest valley, remember who Jesus is. Let's pray. God, we love you and we thank you for guiding us, protecting us. Lord, I pray for each one of us in our dark valleys. Lord, remind us of who you are. Remind us of your presence. Remind us of your power. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.